Want to know the hidden meaning behind what women say and do? Then check out the Chictionary. It's the Wing Girl Methods manual that gives you a full rundown of all the things women say that confuse men written in dictionary format. Go get a copy of the Chictionary by going to winggirlmethod.com slash chick. That's winggirlmethod.com slash chick. Coming up on this week's episode of the Ask Women podcast, We have a very special guest on our show. I know that I say that quite often, but this one is actually extremely special because he is going to teach you about leadership, how to lead women to open up about themselves, be more comfortable around you, express their passions to you, all with very simple questions that don't make you seem like an interviewer or like a pickup artist. So this is an amazing show. And we're also going to talk about how below jobs and how to talk about below jobs so that you get more below jobs from women. So keep listening. Hey guys, welcome to the Ask Women podcast. I hope you guys had a wonderful holiday and awesome new year as well. And uh, I'm your host, Kristen Carney, of course, with Marnie Kinris. I'm trying to be positive. It's 2020. You are, but this is going to air Second. in like middle of February. <laughs> so. Oh, it is? Oh. <laughs> hey, I'm a slow mover. So I'm also yeah. a slow podcaster. So I mean, it still should be happens. exciting to be in the new year, mid-February. We're still in it. Well, We're pro- still, it's new. Yeah, people will take it all the way into March, April. Keep saying yes, happy new year. We'll appreciate the reminder that it's a fresh start. We're giving you another fresh start. So that, see, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ask fresh Women start. Podcast. <laughs> yes, a fresh start number two for you guys and also for our guest today, Dr. Joshua Spodak, Ooh. who is just kind of revealing that he's had the secret identity as a dating coach in addition to being a doctor. So he's kind of like coming out of the closet yeah, as a dating coach, totally is. which is almost scarier than I think coming out of the gay closet. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, Joshua. Hey, now you have me both smiling and like uh, nervous, oh, he's but ex- excited he's and enthusiastic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wait, so, so Josh... Well, as long as you're nervous, that's all I care about. I like to intimidate people. Yeah. So I got introduced to Josh. Did yeah, I did, I, so I said um, that I got introduced to Josh through uh, my friend Brad P. And he just said, you know, you should be on Josh's podcast. He's absolutely fantastic and wonderful, blah, 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 blah. Which I agree about that after I did do his podcast and, and think the same things about Josh, which is why I've also invited him to be on our podcast. And so I'd, I'd love Josh to just sort of give a, a maybe like a two minute explanation of your background of how you got into this world and maybe, you know, what you were doing before where you are a doctor and how this transition kind of happened for you. Sure. So the doctor is not a medical doctor, but a doctor, I have a PhD in physics. And I was, as you might guess, pretty nerdy growing up. And Let's see. I, I still love physics. Well, then you're definitely still nerdy I, now. I, I need <laughs> yeah, oh, totally. <laughs> and, but I at least now I have the option of not being nerdy if I want. At the time, I just yeah, couldn't help point. but be nerdy. And you know, I love physics, but the practice of it to be a researcher wasn't right for me. I had an idea for a, a company for a technology, and I started a company. to. We went out to market, and we operated all around the world, and it was really awesome. In the recession, we got squeezed out by the, I got squeezed out by the investors. I went back to business school and business school, that's where I learned that there are classes in leadership. And it was my first exposure to social and emotional skills. Before that, I just, yeah, I thought you were either born with it or you weren't. That was it. I just figured people didn't understand me and what could I do? And then I started realizing you could really practice this stuff and learn it. And coincidentally, at just a year after business school, a friend of mine gave me a copy of Neil's, Neil Strauss's The Game. And that was my first exposure to you could change how you were with women. And I read it and I thought, all right, so at this point, I'm something like, I think 35, 36 years old. And so I'm not planning on going out to nightclubs and stuff like that. I'd done that before. and But I looked at him at the beginning and thought, that's like me now. And I looked at him at the end and I thought, all right, I don't want to be just like that, but I do want that magnitude of a change. And I said this is what I'm going to work on. This is going to be maybe my number one priority, even though I'm like trying to start businesses and so forth. And oh, it's funny. Years later, my mom would comment on, she's like, Josh, you've, you've, you've become so much more social and you're, you're so much more outgoing and friendly to be with. And I would always say, well, that's because of business school. I learned all this leadership stuff and I'm practicing that with all these people. 
And only about a year ago did I tell her, actually, mom, there's this thing I didn't tell you that I started learning how to pick up girls. There was all this, <laughs> and she was like, what are you talking about? And I started explaining it to her and she's like, that's kind of interesting. Nice. I thought she was going to be like, what's wrong with you? And now I could have told her a long time before. Right. That's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, I was really, I wanted to learn it all on my own at the beginning. And there were, at the time, there were the so-called layers. So I'd go to meet a group of guys and we'd practice together. And, but I didn't want to get coaching for a while. And then eventually I did get coaching and I got, I did Brad P's 3030, which is like a year long program where every month you have a certain assignment, you have to keep doing it month after month. And after that, my goal was, how did I know that I was going to be really good? Partly the relationships I had with women, that was like the main measure, but also I wanted to become a coach. And eventually I tried out and I became, oh man, what an, what an experience it is to try out to become a coach with Brad. And eventually I became a coach with him. And I'll close off with this one thing. He said at the end, or when he, when he brought me on board, he said, Josh, every guy who's not good has some excuse for why he's not good. And usually those excuses don't really hold water. But if he gets coaching from someone who doesn't really get that part, he won't really believe it. So I said, for every excuse guys have, I want to have a different coach. So I want an Asian coach. I want a bald coach. I want a short coach. And he goes, Josh, you're my old coach. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, but how old are you? Now I'm 48. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're old. He looks way young. No, like, yeah, Indian. Like, yeah, he looks much younger. And 48 is not old. No, it's well, well. At the time, I was at that. I was in my late 30s, early 40s, and being in New York, I would get a lot of guys because I'm in New York, and people would come in from basically the East Coast and yeah. West Coast. They go to LA and work with him, but I also got all the divorce guys, all the guys who were coming off long, long relationships who didn't know what they were doing and or they were rusty or never did know. And so I got a big range, but I really started to specialize in men in long term relationships who wanted to meet girls again, meet women again, deepen their relationships. Yeah. So I'd love to hear some advice on that. I know that the original purpose of our time together was to talk about leadership, but I'm sure that this is a part of what you're going to be sharing with us. But maybe tell us a couple of things about guys who are just coming out of a relationship. Some of the common things that you see with these men and some of the common things that you do teach them about how to reframe their thinking so that they're back to being single after being in a relationship for so long. Yeah, a lot of them were, they were so used to how things worked. They didn't know what other women were like. And they would just, they had an expectation of, I would want to have this part of my relationship with this woman and she wanted to have it with me. It didn't work out, but you know, I had a role, she had a role. Why don't these other women play the role that I want them to? Right. And they didn't really know how to lead other women because it was so handed to them before. A lot of them, there were a couple guys who had situations where they just thought it was over. There was one guy, I remember, he had divorced his wife. Now, this being Manhattan, they still lived in the same apartment. And he felt that he could not bring a woman home and so didn't try to meet women. And was just like, he was older than me, so maybe 50. But I think he was ready to coast into the end without ever having intimacy with a woman again. That's crazy. A lot of them grew up in times when they didn't, they thought there was a, a minimum amount of time of like, you had to have a certain number of dates before, forget about sex, just have intimacy. There was this whole courtship that I think grew up in a time when you thought, I would do this, she would do that, I would do this, she would do that, and then things would get closer. And one of the things, that for me was very important was to teach how to create intimacy. And by intimacy, I don't necessarily just mean physical intimacy, emotional intimacy, intellectual intimacy, you know, vulnerability quickly. And at that age, you know, after a certain age, everyone's unique, but a lot of guys didn't want to go to a bar or a club where there'd be lots of women around. And so they didn't, they couldn't do 10 approaches in a night. They couldn't do, you know, shotgun. So it was very important to them. And they had lives that they had lots of stuff to build on. They, they didn't have to make stuff up. They, they had successful businesses and so forth. And so a big part for me was how do you get yourself across very quickly, make her feel comfortable getting her across very quickly so that you can either find out that you're not a match and not waste each other's time, mm. or if you're a match, become very intimate very quickly, which could be physical intimacy, but also emotional, intellectual intimacy as well. 
Yeah. So how do you do it? <laughs> so there's a lot of things. I mean, my, the bread and butter that we would do would be one-on-one coaching. The guys would come to New York and we spend a day together. And the first couple hours was actually mostly talking about what's worked and what hasn't worked. I really had to know who this individual was in order to find out what worked, what didn't work, what he was looking for, what he wasn't looking for. And then a bit of practice of, you know, one thing great about New York, there's lots of... Expressing those things, yeah. Yeah, and also express... Yeah, I remember one guy, <laughs> this would happen a fair amount, actually. Guys who'd say like, I would say, you know, what, what type of woman are you interested in? Because, you know, it's all fine with me, and, and, but it won't really work if you approach women you're not really interested in. And overwhelmingly, they'd say, oh, all women. And then you'd go out and like, they'd only approach women with one skin color or one hair color or one appearance of sorts. And I'd be like, it looks like you're into, it looks like you got a type there. And they're like, yeah. And they wouldn't want to share it. I, I say this myself. I, I have my type and it's, uh, it's always scary to share something that is, makes you vulnerable. Yeah. But actually, after a bit of calibration and finding out where this guy was, I would then give him exercises to work on what he wasn't so strong in. One huge thing, almost every guy I would ask in the lingo, I would say, how's your keynote? You know, how do you, how's your physical interaction with the woman? Do you touch her effectively in, in, a, in a non-threatening way, in, in an inviting way? Is that what Kino is? Yeah, it's from the word kinesthetic. Kino is touching. Yeah, it's touching. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't. I don't know that. I'm not smart. I don't think it's a matter of smart. It's, yeah. <laughs> You're not a pickup artist. You're not a pickup artist. That's okay. why I was going to interject and say it's touching yeah, as well. Yeah. Every guy I asked would say, I'm really good at that. And not one single one of them was really solid. Okay, it. so let me jump in here real quick. Um, really? I'm going to grab onto that Kino thing and maybe take the conversation in a direction Marnie's going to get mad at. But And we can come right back to where we were. Well, so I'm wondering, uh, in my opinion, as a woman, if I heard a guy use industry speak like that in terms of hitting on women, I would be totally grossed out. So are these things that you teach men to kind of keep on the DL, like the down low, speaking of industry speak, so that women don't know like, oh, did you kino whatever? And they're, you know, got, not going to give themselves away or give themselves up that they're <laughs> learning these Are you picturing that when a guy touches a woman, he goes like, Kino, Kino. Like, <laughs> well, well, I'm, picturing, <laughs> I'm picturing if you guys are out at some sort of training or social interaction and a girl happens to overhear guys in the corner that are doing this like boot camp thing saying the word Kino, like, yeah, touch her Kino, not touch her Kino. That's, I'm not trying to say it's like a euphemism <laughs> for something else. But Touch your I, I'm just saying, I think it would be a turnoff. And I'm wondering if these things are kind of stuff that you tell guys. These are terms that you don't eventually, when you're in a relationship, want to say that you are using in terms of trying to find dates. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I would, Kino is about the only one of those lingo words that I would use. And I strongly discourage. That lingo, it's, it had a time and a place when there was a few, a small number of guys on the internet and they were all really geeky and they, to form, they wanted to form a tight community. And when tight communities form, they often make lingos, whether it's guys on the internet chasing girls yeah. or whatever. And that creates unity within that group, but it separates yeah. you from the rest of the world. And the whole thing here is connection. And so it, it would get in the way. So, so our guys, so basically what I'm asking is when you guys work with men, are you advising them to ditch the lingo once they're, you know, I don't yeah, know, the it's kind of a stupid question. Basically, I'll don't answer, I'll answer for you, we had to know. <laughs> yeah, I'll answer for Josh. Yeah. This is all just for learning. It's the same thing as when you start school and you're you're learning some sort of system, it's it's things to make it easy to remember. So even though touch would be easy to remember, but Kino makes it a much more fun way of saying it. So it's not anything that you're, you know, you're in the bedroom and you're like, I'm Kinoing you or, oh, I had to like <laughs> Kino last night or something well, like that. Kino you know, like but an it, old yeah. person card game too? <laughs> yeah. I think it Kino? is. Yes, it is. You're totally yeah. right. 
I think that's oh, okay. Yeah. Same spelling. thing, pronounced but, the same way. Yeah, but I think that's hilarious. I keynote her. We played a lot of cards together. My grandma was there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but so, anyway, <laughs> after having the instruction of not sharing, I mean, you can share this information later because I think it could be kind of interesting for girls, but not like using those phrases with them. But I'd love to hear some of the things that you did tell guys on how to improve their touch after you found out that they were so horrible with it. Well, one of the big things I would do is I had a girlfriend and she was totally supportive of all this stuff because I met her this way. And she was studying to get into medical school and she would like to study at cafes. So I'd tell her, do you mind meeting, do you mind doing your studying at a cafe near Union Square if we were, if we were working at Union Square? And I would say, how's your, how's your touch? And he'd go out and like not even get close to her. And his body language would be very separate, very like facing her. And looking like it's a transaction as opposed to being with her and next to her. And so I'd say, you know, I got a girlfriend. She's around. And look, I'm straight. I'm not going to spin you around. I'm not going to have you spin me around. I'm not going to have you touching me. But she's more than happy to be our foil. And if you'd like, we could meet her. And she's, you know, we'll rough, it'll be roughly around noon or one o'clock and we'll go over there. And they'd always say, oh, I don't really know. And then we go and she's super friendly and she's very attractive. Mm-hmm. She's an ex now. She's still friendly and attractive. And then I would start, I would say, here's some things to practice. And I would show him things that he could do with her. Like when you meet, how to walk up to her and put your hands out. So she'll put her hands in your hands. And then I do this like, little double cheek kiss and spin her around. And it ends with her hand in the uh, inside of my elbow. And I would start walking. And this little move is, it's got a bit of dance in it. And it, girls love it. I mean, I can't say all girls love it. There's obviously a selection effect. The girls that love it are the ones, the ones that stick with me are the ones who like that. And the guy would be like, whoa, what's that? And I'd say, okay, here's what you do. You do it like this. And then he'd try it and he'd fumble and he'd do it all wrong and she'd kind of be patient. And then he'd practice and practice and practice. And eventually you would see her eyes light up when she's like, oh, wow, yeah. that was really good the way you did it that time. And this is experiential learning. I mean, this is a major part of how I teach leadership, how I teach everything. and. You have to start with very simple things and advance to more advanced things. So another thing I would teach, because she really loved it, was she loved being thrown against a wall. And I don't know how this sounds to people if they haven't heard it before, but this would be walking... I mean, the optimal time is when I'm walking down the street, she's to one side of me, there's a wall to my left. She says something that makes me laugh or says something that I really love and I want to make her feel great about that. Or maybe she like patted me on the butt or did something sexy to me. And then I'll spin her around in front of me so that she goes against, like, say she's on my right. I'll grab her hand or her waist, rather, and spin her around in front of me. So now she's coming over to my left. And then I put one hand behind her so that she doesn't hit the wall herself. She, my hand is there. And with the other hand, I go around her and I go, it's hard to describe, but easy if, if you're there. And then I'm looking her in the eyes. And usually I, I, I want to see something like a look in her eyes of like, keep doing this. Because if I see a look in her eyes of like, don't do this, and I, I, I don't want to continue. And that's throwing her against the wall. I would actually look for if there's a doorway so that there's a little entrance way so we could be out of traffic. That would be nice because then I throw her into this little nook and we have a little more privacy. If there's construction going on and it's like, what do you call it? Like the, the plywood walls that they put on construction sites. Then when she goes back against the wall, I can also hit it with my hand and it makes a loud noise. And she liked that. You can't do this. Is not like when you're first meeting a girl, right? But these can all definitely be sexy for sure. And I think it's important that that it's okay to start awkward because this stuff is like that's advanced, I think, or that sounds very suave. So it's okay to not start out at that level. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. This is if they're with me for a day, I want to teach them some things that they're going to reach later. Right. For me, the first time someone taught me about throwing a girl, a girl against the wall, it was mind-blowing because I thought, well, that sounds violent. That doesn't sound like something anyone would like. Yeah. <laughs> and the guy walked me through and was like, put your feet here and put your hands there. And, and then one day I was doing it and I spun a girl around and, against a wall. And she was the look in her eyes was just like, I don't know what you did, but more, more, more. And I was like, oh, women aren't yeah. fragile. If anything, we want it. Yeah. Women aren't... Yeah, no, we can definitely take a good a good roughing up sometimes <laughs> in, a, in a sexy way, for sure. Yeah. And I, you know, all, a lot of my learning about my relationships with women and creating intimacy with them and getting closer with them, 
it made me rethink everything that I knew before because I had always put women up on a pedestal and I just felt like I was lucky just to be talking to one who was, had a modicum of beauty or intelligence and I just had to earn everything from them. And that was really dehumanizing. I thought it was putting them up, but it was, it was just separating. And I, and I felt like that was what society taught me. I felt like I was being a really good boy, a, you know, a nice guy, you could say. And now it's much more about connecting with them. Who, like, who is this, this individual with me right here, right now? And how can I share myself? How can I, yeah, how do I make her feel comfortable sharing herself? That, that's really the techniques I learned there of making someone feel comfortable sharing what makes them feel vulnerable. Yeah. That's what, that's what their passions are. I should say that word first. How to make someone feel comfortable sharing what she cares about. Yeah, people. And it's not just women, men too, in, in terms of a leadership context. What, is, what, what motivates someone? Because most people, what makes them, what they're passionate about, makes them feel vulnerable. And so they protect it. But it's also the most important things in our lives are the things that we care about most. That really genuinely could not be truer. Because it's like, if anyone brings up comedy or some, I, you know, somewhat of a comedian type, if anyone brings that up, I instantly almost go into a shell. And that's my favorite thing in the world. And let me guess, let me ask if you meet someone who, when they make you feel comfortable talking about it, and when you talk about it, they speak about it in a supportive, non-judgmental way. How do you respond? Super positively. Because all of a sudden I realize I don't have to be on the defensive and I don't have to over-explain who I am or why I like it or why I might consider myself funny. And all of a sudden you're just accepted and then you can be. And I think being is the most important part of being able to be vulnerable is when you can just be. And that's what I worked on was how to behave and communicate in ways to make the other person feel comfortable sharing what they care about most. And when they do that, to respond with support. And when that happens, we love sharing what we care about as long as we don't expect to feel judged. So what's a good way to support what someone's into if you're not also into it? You know, if you love comedy and you meet someone else who does, you can go, oh yeah, awesome. I love it too. It's great. It's great. But if you're someone who's not into video games and the guy's like, I'm super into video games, what does someone say back to that to show that it's supportive, they're supporting it, but they're not faking that they're into it also. I can answer broadly, and but I can tell you that the real way to answer that is through experiential learning. So broadly, what I say is that if I were to... Well, let me ask you, if, if you yeah. don't mind, either of you, what's a passion of yours besides work and family? Um, work and family, neither are passions. Um, <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Marnie, do you want to go? I'm so say your passion. I don't. I don't know. I just said comedy. I don't know. Have anything else? My pa- my passion is people. I love people. That's my passion. So I'm going to go with Kristen and comedy because I actually did stand up. I did open mic stand up for the first time, and then I did it eight times this year or 2019. And I was doing it because I do a lot of keynotes and public speaking, and I wanted to practice that my own material. And actually, the woman I learned from. She was originally, she was also a very geeky person and she was a teacher and she wanted to teach in a, to connect with her students more. And so she was using it as like a pedagogical technique. What's comedy for you, if you don't mind my asking? Is it one of those things? No, no, it's not as I think well thought out or done for a purpose. It's just who I am and I have no choice. That's interesting because for me, it was really <laughs> hard to do. I felt like I had to force myself to, but for you, you had no choice but to do it? Well, not necessarily stand-up per se, but comedy in general is just who I am. So I don't, it's, you know, almost like a being gay thing or something. It's just who you are and you can't change it and it's in there. So if you don't express it, then you feel crippled and strange. And so without being funny or doing anything involved in the world of comedy, I feel like I can't breathe or I don't feel like I'm being myself. So when you're on stage, you're just being you? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, see for Carney. Oh my God. <laughs> so when you're up on stage, when I felt really, I'm my heart's like racing, but for you, it's you're just being you? No, it's definitely still something where your nerves are involved because like you said before, if someone's passionate about something, they get they can get very defensive or however you phrase that. So when I'm on stage, if people aren't enjoying me or I'm having a bad set, 
I get really, really, really upset. And so it's due to the fact that I'm really passionate about it and very close to it. So yeah, no, I definitely don't feel at ease all the time. I feel at ease having conversations with people being funny. But if I'm on stage and not being received well, I go into like, I almost black out with anxiety. Because it's like, no, 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 but this is who I am. And you're not seeing me for who I am. And you're misunderstanding me. And so, yeah. Oh, look how much Josh just got her to open up, which is your <laughs> your point. Right? I'm So I'm glad Marnie picked up on that. <laughs> did you feel... How do you feel about what you just said to me? My heart's pounding. I'm angry. Really? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, my I, heart... I mean, because I'm talking about something I'm passionate about, I do feel a little sense of elevation in my energy level at the moment. But other than that, yeah, I feel a little bit... A little... Uh, it takes me up a level. Okay. And... Th- I had, when you joked, I was pretty sure you were joking, but I had to say really because I knew that I was talking about something important to you. And if I didn't treat that respectfully, even once I could lose everything. Now, you asked me a little while ago, how do do you make someone feel comfortable? And I don't know if you could tell, I, did you feel like I was running a script with you? A little bit? Yes. Okay. I'm probably, if we were not if you had not just asked me, how do you do something? Yeah, you might be not more. have been expecting me to totally. like, demonstrate it. Totally. So yeah. I asked you what a passion of yours was. Yeah, if you guys were sitting on a date and you had this guy. Yeah. So one of the things that I did was when you said what a passion of yours was, a lot of people when they heard comedy would say, really, why? Or they might ask you more. But for you just to say comedy, that's you're going out a bit on a limb because I could judge you for that. I could laugh at you or I could, uh, and not in the way that you meant, meant to be laughed at. I could manipulate you. Instead, what I did was, in this case, I responded by talking about two people in a, in a supportive, non judgmental way myself and the person who I learned comedy from. And I believe only you know how you felt, but I've done this exercise with a lot of people. And when I ask them, how did you feel? A lot of them feel. Well, if you spoke about them in a supportive, non judgmental way, then you'll probably talk about me in a supportive, non judgmental way. And that usually leads someone to go a little bit farther out. You know, when you say comedy, you don't, you're not just because I ask you your passion, you're not going to tell me your whole life story and everything about it because you're a bit nervous. Oh, I might. But you might. But I, in general, you can't count on that. Right. And so then the person gives a bit more of an answer. And it almost is always the case that after I say, you know, I know right. someone who does it, that for this reason, someone who does it, for that reason, what's your reason? Then they start giving more of an answer. And then I listen for what I call the meaning carrying words, which is the nonverbal communication, the emotion that the words can't carry, usually come out in a couple words that people say. Salespeople know this technique as well. It's not like I made it up. So you said in, in your words, I'm just being me. And you also said, Oh, no choice. You said you didn't have a choice. And choice is a pretty powerful word to me, an emotional word. And it was the opposite of my experience. So did you notice when I said, when I asked you about not having a choice? Yes, I did. Yeah. And I, for that resonate, that resonated with me because it's so not a choice that when I hear people say they do stand up for an end goal or a purpose, it almost makes me get uncomfortable. Like, because I can't imagine how hard that would be for you guys to experience, but also for the audience. No offense. Oh man, it's brutal. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right. So the whole idea of doing something for an outcome is strange. Not not everything, but something like that for me, because I'm so in it in that sense. And also, did you notice when I asked you about that you're just being you on stage? Yeah, after that, when you talked for at, at, at length. Yes, right. You bring out the passion. So I see basically what you're doing, I feel like, is you're getting to the core of a human experience and pulling it, or not pulling it out because you're not using force. You're just naturally letting it come out. Yeah. So I love that because when I when I tell guys that you know they should be talking with women, or I'm sorry, talk, making conversation, I say it just in general, just make conversation. But when you do it, try to go into it from the angle of what experience is this person having? So like, for example, if you're eating out alone by yourself and the waitress comes up to you and is just blah, 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 whatever, seems kind of lethargic. If you ask her something that she might really get passionate about, you might open someone up to bigger conversations. So you'd ask something like, 
and I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. You'd ask something like, how are the tips here? Because they're not going to be expecting that question and they're going to have an opportunity to be honest and open and to really just be true. Whereas if you're a server, you're being polite all day long. So all of a sudden, if you're allowed to just let right. go, I feel like it allows people to all of a sudden feel like they know you because you're asking a question that's like a few layers below a first question. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. Wait, I'm going to interrupt you for one for one second because we have to take a quick break and then I want to come back and hear what you think. Because I, I actually, I love what Christian just said. So let's take a quick break and come back with Josh and find out his point of view on what Christian just said. One of the best feelings of dating is when you get those butterflies in your stomach, but butterflies kind of come and go quickly. And if we want those butterflies more often, we have to take things into our own hands. And that's why I'm telling you guys about this app called Dipsy. It's an audio app full of short, sexy stories and guided sessions that are designed to turn your lady on and keep those butterflies flying for both you and her. And another thing that's awesome about Dipsy is that they have new content every week. So if you're getting busy, that's good because Dipsy's busy, keeping you busy. So this year, try a new way of getting turned on with Dipsy. And for listeners of our show, Dipsy is offering a 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash askwomen. That's a 30-day free trial. Free, baby. When you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash askwomen. That's dipsystories.com slash askwomen. How are you feeling right now? Are you in a good mood, having a good day? Do you have energy? Or are you kind of like, meh? maybe a little bit off. If that's the case, think about what you're sleeping on every night. What's your mattress like? Is it good? Is it mediocre? Is it bad? It should be nothing but good and great. So if you are feeling like blah and you need a ha, you've got to try a purple mattress. The founders of Purple are two brothers who have been developing cushioning technology for 30 years. 30 years. It's longer than a lot of you have been alive but it's actually shorter than the amount of time you'll want to be asleep on one of their beds because their mattresses are like nothing you've ever felt before. It's this combination of hard and soft at the exact same time. You are going to love purple. And right now our listeners will get a free purple pillow with the purchase of a mattress. That's in addition to the great deals they're already offering site-wide. So just text Ask Women to 84888. The only way to get this free pillow is to text Ask Women to 84888. That's one word, Ask Women to 84888. Message and data rates may apply. All right, so we are back. So Kristen had just, sh- well, actually, Josh and Kristen shared information about how to get a woman to open up. So basically, what I was hearing from both of you is that you're not just going for the basic chit chat, interview, bullshit conversations. You're trying to get a level deeper so that when you're at that deeper level of being open, it's easier for things to happen, whether it's attraction, flirtation, escalation. Once you've sort of like peeled those levels back, then that person's a little bit more raw. And I loved the example that Kristen was giving of asking a question that lets somebody let their hair down. So I want to hear what Josh has to say about that. I agree with the questions. The big thing for me is the next step because the next step is showing support with their answer. And because people feel nervous. When you ask that question, when I ask people, what's a passion of yours? They the general tone is, or the, the the feelings that people tell me they have, and what I feel when someone asks me, because I have people do this exercise back to me to practice it, is you feel nervous at first. You're like, what, what's going to happen right. if I share this? I hope I didn't. What if I share something that is meaningful to me and they think it's stupid? Then I have to retreat. And, and so how do you follow it up? One way is to talk about other people in a supportive, non-judgmental way. There's a couple other ways too. And when you show it's really just being non-judgmental and accepting yeah. what they've said is kind of cool or just accepting it. Like, okay, maybe I don't have this experience that you're talking about, but I know four other people that do, or that I think it's awesome that you do. Do you rec- do you recommend yeah, so following up with questions? So for example, if a guy told me he was really into video games and I could care less about video games, but I'm being supportive and non-judgmental, do I follow up with the question like you asked, like, well, why? Why do you connect so much with video games? Or do I take it to what's your favorite video game? Like, do you try to maybe go out of the deepness for a second so you can not feel like you're pressuring them to all of a sudden be in a psych- psychological you know, discussion? What do you recommend the follow-up is? Well, the way that I teach it is to practice 
a couple techniques over and over again in the way that a piano player would practice scales over and over again. Not because you're always going to play scales for the rest of your life, but if you practice the scales, or in tennis, if you practice the ground strokes, or dancers have to practice footwork. And generally, when you go out and do it in the real world, you don't just play scales. But scales are what open you up. That's, this is one of my major analogies for how I teach leadership and meeting someone of the opposite sex or meeting just people in general as a subset of leadership to me. Leadership is to me is not telling people what to do. Some people think that. And so, I mean, if you teach every, I don't know, baseball player, when they learn how to, how to swing a bat, you know, it's like keep your eye on the ball, take your left step forward with your left foot, swing the bat in a certain way. But every baseball player has their own unique way of swinging. And likewise, I give people the same couple exercises and I say practice and practice this one technique until you have it down. And just like when a piano player plays scales enough so they don't have to, you know, at the beginning, someone who wants to play Carnegie Hall, they want to play their heart out. And you still start with, you know, put this finger on that key, this finger on that key, this finger on that key, and that's how you play the scale. Once the muscle memory is down well enough and you don't have to think about that, then you emerge. And you do it your way. And so when you realize the technique of how to support someone, how to make someone feel listened to, how to make someone feel understood, then you can take my crutches, my training wheels that I gave you, and you can get rid of those and you can do it your own way. To say this doesn't convey what happens when you actually do it in the same way that I can tell you all about scales, but it doesn't, it doesn't really get you to experience expressing yourself through your music. I don't know if I got too out there on that one. No, no, no. It, no, no it that does, totally it makes sense. sense. My question is that how... So it, it's funny because I'm listening to this and I, I think like there's a portion of women who would be like, oh, okay, this is kind of boring and like I only want you as my friend. And yes, it's nice to talk about me and share and expand for sure. I can talk about my passions, but I'm not going to see you as like an object of desire. And that's typically women, I would say, who are under 30, who are going to kind of have that response. Women who are over 30 or probably out of a, an, a relationship, I think are going to be very responsive to this because they do have somebody that's listening to, to them. So how do you actually transition any of this? Because we're talking about leadership. So how do you lead this towards something a little bit more sexual and flirtatious so that there's attraction there rather than just a friendship being built? That's where the nonverbal communication comes in. So the touch, I recommend, I've said this so many times, it's almost, I haven't said this in years, but I don't have to think about it. Back of the hand to between the shoulder and the elbow is like the front of the hand to a part of the body that could curl around and grab. So you don't want to do that. But back of the hand to between the shoulder and the elbow is generally a, that's almost like a handshake. And I like to establish some sort of physical touch that's non-threatening and socially acceptable within the first second or two, often even before I say the first words. And then there's also the eye contact and the pacing of the words. And, and if you're f- standing face to face, looking right at each other, that's the way you face if you're ordering a slice of pizza. You expect to have a transaction for a couple seconds and you're going to walk away. Right. Whereas when you're talking with your friends, you're going to talk for a long time. It's usually shoulder to shoulder, facing either the same way or like 45 degrees off from each other. And the nonverbal communication is where the emotion comes out. So I'm going, to have, I'm going to have eye contact with a business person, but it's going to be very different eye contact than I'm going to have with a woman who's flirting with me. And that's another set of... That's another language that you have to learn that if you haven't practiced it, you just don't have any fluency in it. But if you practice it, you will develop fluency in it over time. Yeah, I agree. Actually, I'm going to interject for two seconds because I was watching Matt Hussey on... Oh my God, which Good Morning America or something that he was on. And Matt Hesse is a coach for women. And he actually gave a really, really wonderful tip that I wanted to share that goes hand in hand with what Josh was just talking about, about like the way that you position yourself. So he was saying that on, on dates, if you're going to be going out for food, especially if it's a first date, you don't want to sit across from each other. It's actually oh, no. better yeah. if you sit side by side. And you don't have to like sit side by side at a booth because that's so awkward on a first date. But try to get a spot up at the bar because at the bar feels like less pressure, less intense and you don't have to stare at a person while they're eating. You can look around at a whole bunch of other things. It's not rude to do so. So everything just like takes the pressure off. Plus you can have interesting interactions from side to side rather than from face to face. So I thought that it's very, you know, in line with what you're saying, but I think that that's 
a great thought to have and a great tip for guys that when they do go out, especially in those first few dates, to position themselves in that way so that they're not so intense. Yeah, now I'm going to jump way far ahead. After a man has gotten very skilled at expressing himself and putting himself out there so he he can be vulnerable and if she likes what she sees and, and she supports you back, then I like my first date. I mean, I'm not dating. I've, I'm with someone now, but when I was dating, my go-to first date would be to meet her nearby and, and overtly say, like, come over to my place for dinner. And we would cook together, which is, I would say, t- I mean, that's a step way beyond just sitting next to each other because now food is very sensual and actively doing things together is cooperative. And the challenge is, how can you meet someone so that the first time you meet, whether it's online or in person, that she feels comfortable enough coming over to your place? That's yeah. not easily done, but it's well within the realm of possibility. But it comes with practice. Absolutely. We're going to wrap up our show pretty soon, but I want to cover one thing that you had, you had written to me. So it's you said that things we could talk about today. One was a talk that you've never shared publicly that connects blowjobs to the core of how to lead effectively. It leads to how I've made my peer group, which include. Do you want me to share this? Or I, I wasn't sure if I could read this, but it includes Nobel. I actually don't even know. What is that? Oh, Nobel Prize winners. Nobel Prize win- winners, Victoria's Secrets Angels, and Titans of Industry. So these are people who are in your friend circle, and they're things that you've done similar to what you're sharing now that have made you friends, be able to be friends with these people because you are one of these people now. But I wanted to hear the connection between blowjobs to the core of how to lead effectively. I thought that that was interesting. So I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on this and what you want to talk about. Now, I'd love to share. It may take a little time. I don't want to go over. No, we have about seven minutes. Seven minutes is probably not going to fit in that time, but I'll start it. And if we want to keep going, we can keep going okay. on another time or something like that. Okay, perfect. So going back, it was actually on my mind. As soon as you asked, what about, about trends with the older guys? One of the common trends was, I got married and that's the last blowjob I ever got from her. And this was routinely the case. And it might not be specifically blowjobs, but like the sex would decrease a lot. And when I asked, I would say, well, was she like, did she feel like forced to give you blowjobs before? And he's like, no, she loved it. And you liked, I would say like, you liked it and she liked it. And, but then it became contentious. And he was like, I bought her diamond rings and the blowjobs would dry up. And for a long time, this got to me. How is it possible that two people who both liked something ended up both it being something that would break them apart? And this troubled me for a long because time. Because of bacteria. <laughs> it was tragic. Right. <laughs> to me, it's like right, a tragedy. Exactly, it's it's the in your mouth. <laughs> Sorry, go on. It is, it a, tragedy. is a tragedy. I, it is. Right. I, I miss. But I, I miss doing there it. Are worse tragedies. So, as a, yeah, but no. But I'm just saying, like, as a married woman, I don't do it as much, and I miss doing it. I used to like it a lot, but. The, well, it's something, okay, here's the deal. This is why. Because it's something you do to almost earn your boyfriend or what? girlfriend. Once you've earned them and you've got them. Yeah. I, but I liked it before. I of liked course. doing it. Yeah, because it was more exciting Maybe. and new. But at the same time, yes, that combined with the fact that like you want to keep this person happy, but now that you're married, you're like, right. yeah, I got him. I don't have to really try so hard. That's it's that simple. Or well, there's other reasons for it. That can be a whole because other it's really not. But I want to like, hear what Josh is saying because I I, yeah, I have yeah. my own reasons for it. But yeah, let's hear let's hear what Josh has to say. Sorry to interrupt you. Not at all. I'm enjoying this and and I'm always gathering information on this because I always want to refine my understanding and what I do about it. Because to me, it's not just understanding what happened, but also what to do about it. And I right. propose, I'm just going to go on to this, not paying attention to the time. And if if yeah, okay. I'm not sure what to ha- how to handle it because I do a podcast too and there's all, all the technicalities you have to figure out. But No, no don't worry. Don't worry about right. that. Just, just a broad generalization is great. That's what I prefer always. <laughs> so the issue is that I saw it as it became transactional and the emotions around it became, mm-hmm. I'm going to give you this yes. and you're going to give me that. Yeah. And well, when it comes to trans- the emotions around transaction aren't particularly romantic emotions. They're more business-like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. if it becomes a physical interaction in one direction, and a monetary or material thing going in the other direction. There's an infinite amount. There's one thing that's infinite. That like 
you can give as many blowjobs, there's as many blowjobs as you want to give, but money you run out of. So you're going to get inflation and it's going to cost more and more and more. Right. And eventually that means someone who wants to give a blowjob is going to feel like I'm getting paid for this. Like it's not, I'm not getting paid enough. And then the other person will be like, well, I'm I'm giving you all I can. And that's the least you could do is this. And this tears relationships apart. I'm not saying it's the only thing that happens. No, but it's it's part of it. Now, here's the thing. If she liked giving a blowjob before, then she's, there's something about it that she likes. So I'm going to ask you guys the way that I ask men. I, I've only worked with straight men, so if this sounds heterosexual, I, I don't know what to say about that, but I would work with straight guys. But I'm going to ask you guys, what's the proper way, in your opinion, not in an absolute sense, but just for you, what's the best way, what's the proper way for a blowjob to end? <laughs> Definitely with money being exchanged. <laughs> <laughs> When the check clears? Yes. <laughs> then it's over. Marnie can answer. The proper way, like in the best case scenario way, it would be like... Yeah, for, for you to walk away feeling like that was a great, yeah, that was a great interaction. Yeah, for them to say like, that, that was amazing. Maybe give me a kiss after I've cleaned up. I'm not like a girl who needs to have a kiss after I've had somebody's penis in my mouth. I can go and clean up and wash my mouth. So I don't need that, but yeah, somebody saying like that was amazing, like absolutely amazing. Then pulling me in close afterwards would be great. Not just like it, not just like a finale. Like, okay, great, we're done. Okay, so for you, it's like for when the guy says, so there's a nice after bit of of wow, that was amazing, and he pulls you up and maybe holds you tight, something yeah. like that shows, his... and either reciprocates unless he had done and, something before, but yeah, that it wasn't like the the end. Okay, and. What might you guess for a, lot, for a lot of guys, what might their answer be of how a blowjob ends properly? Coming. Yeah. That's what I would say, say too. So a lot of guys might say that. Yeah, when, when he comes, or in his words, he would say, when I come, that's when it's over. And all right, so I'm going to... Now, I would say to them, okay, I'm going to say to you, and I'll say to you what I say to them, that in my opinion, a blowjob ends properly when the woman says to me, thank you. Wait, What? Are you... When the woman says thank you. Like she's thanking that, you for allowing that, wait, you to give her, give you a blowjob. Okay, so I'm sorry. What are That's they not quite it. For? <laughs> so I, I let it hang there for a while. I know I'm saying something. I, I generally believe that I'm... I, I think that I'm saying something that most men will be like, what? That's odd. I wouldn't expect that. And so I let it sit there for them to think about it for a bit because it's not the usual thing. So... If she doesn't want to give a blowjob, I don't want her to give it. It has to be come. It has to be coming from something internal to herself. She wants to. Be, she, I don't want a blowjob unless she has a reason for wanting to do it. And if she wants to, if she, if there's anything about blowjobs that she likes, I know I got something that she doesn't have that makes it possible. And so there's something that I that we've done together. Now, what does she like about it? Different women are going to like blowjobs for different reasons. And just some reasons might be mm-hmm. some women are going to want to please a man and make him feel good, uh, which could be a, make him feel good mo- emotionally. But some women might like to make a man feel good physically. Some women might be into a power play and she wants to be dominant. Or some women, women they might be into improving themselves and they want to get better and more skilled and it's really about getting really good themselves. Whatever it is, I don't know what it is, but she does. Right. And so I want the blowjob for her to be what she wants out of it. So if she likes being submissive and I treat it like it's something where she's dominant, even if she likes it in principle, I might mess it up for her. If, I, if she really wants to be on her knees and feeling like she's submitting and I'm like, you're so strong when you do that. I love when you tell me what to do. She, that might turn her off. Okay. So I got to find out what she likes. Going back to what I said before, and this is the core of my leadership technique, is I have to behave and communicate in ways to make her feel comfortable sharing what it means for her. Yeah, absolutely. When I find that out, sorry? I said absolutely. And that that goes across in every area of your relationship. It's about communication. Everything you're talking about, I, I completely agree with and I hear what you're saying. And so I want it, I want it to be for her what she wants it to be. And so I'm going to adopt my perspective. Now, if she likes to be submissive and I like to be submissive, which I don't, but if that were the case, then it might not match because we're, the poles aren't quite, they don't fit together. 
So it has to be within the realm of, you have to realize what I want and what she wants. They have to be close enough that they can match. And usually they do. And if they do, then I want to express myself and make her feel comfortable and make and support her for what she's what she's doing in her heart and make it that for her. So that when she's done, if she's really into if she's into making herself better and learning, then I might say, wow, the, that's the best one you've done so far. I can't wait to see how you do it next time. And if she's into making me feel good, I want to say, wow, that made me feel so good. I almost blacked out or something like that. So I want to be true to myself, but I also want to tune myself to what makes it great for her. Yeah, which I think is wonderful. I mean, that, but that's that's in every area of the relationship. I think what happens once you get married is that maybe you are right, Chris, and what you were saying. It's not like, okay, I want this ring on my finger. I want this marriage. I want whatever it is that your your goal is with this person of like, not that you're doing it to get that, but it's still like an like a, a pleasing thing. And it's a, he'll like me more if I do this, or this is awesome that I'm doing this. I'm a, I'm a great girlfriend that I'm doing. There's, there's something subconscious that is happening there. Yeah, because I mean, let's be honest, unless we're at like, you know, some sex convention where everyone's super into sex, blowjobs really, I mean, it's like running on, it's like running on a treadmill. And it's like me thanking the treadmill. Like, thank you, treadmill, for letting me run on you and feel like death now. I'm going to get something good out of the fact that I ran on the treadmill, but it's it's work. If you're a, not a woman and you've never done it before, right. women aren't always turned on the way men are. Men are always ready to go. And if you're a woman and you're not really feeling like deeply sexual and all of a sudden, you know, this idea of a blowjob, you're kind of like, all right, it's like going to the gym. All right, I got to get this done. Because you can't always love a blowjob. Yeah. That's where I was going to make my point. Yeah, because I think that that when you're married, there's other things that make you feel sexual that were not in place when you were just in a relationship. It's it like something shifts. There's different responsibilities, there's different stresses, there're different roles that you have now that suddenly the way to make you feel sexy is not the same way as it was before, which I think what Josh is talking about is like really just checking in with the person that you're with and figuring out what turns them on, what's super sexy. Kristen said it a million times on this podcast. Like, you know, you empty the dishwasher, like that, that gets me wet. Like, <laughs> like that gets me going. Like that those, those things do come into play for women later on down the road and they become more difficult for partners to give. So while you know, the focus of leadership in the bedroom by understanding what, what your partner likes is fantastic. I think that it does expand a little bit more, but I think that your tool of, of actively listening and being inquisitive is wonderful from the first date all the way up until, you know, you, you die side by side. So I think, I think that it's wonderful. And I completely agree with you, Josh. And I'm going to apply it to a totally different, I'm going to show you how I apply it to a totally different area. So my podcast okay. that Marnie, Marnie, you know this from experience, is I have the Leadership in the Environment podcast. And basically everyone I've, I've met knows that there's some environmental issues in the world. Even if you don't believe in global warming, you still don't want mercury in your fish. And virtually no one is really trying to act on it, trying to act sustainably. I mean, they'll do some stuff with straws, but they're not doing really big things. And if you listen to my podcast with my guests, I don't do what almost everyone else does. What I, what I see in the world is there's a lot of people saying, like, here's some tips, here's something you could do to, for the environment. But it's not asking the person what they care about. And so on my podcast, and I, on my first TEDx talk, I explain exactly this process, but I ask people, what does the environment mean to you? And almost always, they give some non-committal answer, some abstract answer. Because I think most people have heard, like when they share what the environment means, then people like, that's not really, you know, Florida's going to be underwater and you're thinking about that time you swam with the dolphins or something that, usually it's something, a um, childhood memory or something like that. When that comes out, then I ask them to think of something they could do to act on what they care about. And almost always people think, oh, well, I'll do something what the New York Times told me to do, but it's not what they really cared about. And so when I make them feel comfortable using the techniques I just described, then they act on the environment for their reasons, not because someone told them to. And then it becomes meaningful and purposeful for them. And you'll hear on their second episodes on the podcast, they often thank me for doing something 
like picking up trash off the ground or going without disposable coffee cups for a month or something like that. And they feel like, I want to do more of this. And it's this crazy thing that happens that Nobel Prize winners and heads of major like Fortune 5 companies say, now that I've done this once, I want to do more. And they thank me for leading them to do something that others might say that's dirty or deprivation, but when they're doing it for their own reasons, they really love it. And so I've applied what I learned coaching guys about blowjobs to, I believe, lead and hopefully create major figures to become, or help major figures in the world to become role models because I think we're lacking role models in the area of the environment. It's the same technique, but applied in a different place. I, I love, basically, <laughs> you're, you're finding out how people work and you're, you're letting them tell you themselves, right? Which they love it's, to do. It's just being inquisitive. Yeah, people like talking about themselves and they really tell you what they're passionate about. They tell you what their triggers are. They tell you the roadmap on how to make them happy, but you just have to ask. And support them because the first answer is only going to be support, what I call yes. a cocktail party answer. They're like, okay, I like books. I like movies. All right, but that can mean a lot more. Do you like writing books? Do you like reading books? Do you like buying and selling books? There's so much more underneath and that they want to share if they feel like the person will support them and not judge them. I, I totally agree with you. That's how to make a relationship intimate quickly. I completely agree with you. And that is a great place to end our show. So Josh, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about leadership, about blowjobs, about how to get people <laughs> to be more comfortable with you, how to get them to open up to you, questions to... Anyway, all of it. It was fantastic and wonderful. So yeah, how do people get in contact with you if they want to work with you, find out more about you? So the big thing is joshuaspodek.com at my website. And that has that will link to my books. It will link to my podcast and it's how to reach me. Uh, everything's there. I'm going to mention that the exercise that I did with, uh, with Kristen about that meaningful connection, that's actually chapter 17 in my book. And I feel, I can't tell you guys how great you make me feel that now for the first time I can tell like the public, at least the people who listen to your podcast will know the secret of where that exercise came from. And I wanted, like, it's, this is a passion of mine that I want to get out there. I've been keeping it inside for so long. So my book, Leadership Step-by-Step, Step, is all the exercises that will make you an effective leader that people will want you to lead them again. They'll thank you for leading them. And so that book, there's another book, Initiative, and my podcast are the real ways to learn my technique, what I do, and how you can get you know, Nobel Prize winners and Victoria's Secret Angels in your life. I absolutely love it. Thank you for coming on to this show. And thank you, Oh, Chris. and I have to oh, say... Oh, go on, go on. Marnie will be a guest on my show as well. So specifically come to listen to Marnie's episode. Oh, yeah. And I'm coming back on tomorrow, right? To Yeah, we're recording tomorrow. Yes, because I... And what's gonna... the name of your podcast? Oh, yeah. Tell them. It's the Leadership and the Environment Podcast. Awesome. Okay, fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on to this show. You were fantastic. You guys are awesome. We'll see you next week. Bye.